Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and what's next. It's a show that asks questions and peels back the layers of our average everyday experience and goes beyond scratching the surface. We interview people doing incredible things who are making a difference around the globe. Join me as we listen in and get one step closer to understanding that big ideas shared create collaboration, collaboration can inspire community, and communities create social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So this next interview, you are going to uh, really enjoy. It's with Brandon Bryant and Tonya hessen Shea. Uh, it was a real privilege for me to interview them. I'm hoping we're going to have a part two. We barely scratched the surface on a pretty serious issue. Uh, I guess Brandon's being called a, a whistleblower. You're going to have to dig in a little bit deeper, read the bio, check out the website dronethedocumentary.com. It, it premieres in North America next Friday. And uh, we, we talked about a lot of things. We talked about um, um, drones. We talked about trust. And we talked about relationships and about war and, and things that matter, frankly. And I think you're going to be really impressed with, with Brandon and, 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 and where he's landed. Um, check out the film. It's, it's worth seeing for so many reasons. Uh, it's about becoming a better human, as corny as that may sound. Don't forget to check out davidpecklive.com. Uh, more podcasts there and rabble.ca. Buckle up. Uh, it's a good interview. You're going to enjoy this one. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We are joined by two very special guests today, um, and I'm going to do my best to get Tonya's last name pronounced right. Tonya Hessenshe. Is that good? That sounds very good. Excellent. And Brandon Bryan, uh, thank you both for uh, joining us today uh, on Face to Face. Thank you for having us. So I think the audience is going to find out. They probably know a little bit about you already. They've read the bio. Uh, maybe they've seen the film. Uh, we're going to talk about the website, I hope, as well. Let's let's get as much information out there as we can about this film. This is, um, uh, Tonya, you've made this film Drone. Yes. Give me, can you give me a minute on why, how, how do you get drawn into that? How do you get drawn into making a film about drones? Or is the question really, what is this film really about? Well, I think for me, uh, you know, I got the idea in 2010 uh, when I was working on my last film, Play Again. Um, and in Play Again, I look at how kids in the States are, are growing up behind screens and spend most of their time in the virtual world. And um, I came across the story of a gamer who dropped out of high school, joined the military, and very quickly became a drone pilot um, with very little training. And to me, it was terrifying to think of how young kids uh, go from getting points per kill to actually killing real people on the mm. other side of the world. And this was, you know, right as Obama was starting to ramp up the drone strikes uh, in Pakistan. Um, and I just got furious to see how he went from the promise of closing down Guantanamo to just simply killing thousands of people outside of the clear war zones with no uh, transparency and no accountability and the rest of the world just being silent. So, so that's, uh, you know, how, how this film started. So, so and please, uh, Brandon, uh, pop in wherever because I've, I've got some questions for you as well, but is, is, is this film really about drones? Or is this, a, is this a film about freedom? Is this a film about war? Is this a film about social justice? I mean, or, or is it about all of the above? I think, you know, this, this film is, uh, is basically about the CIA drone war. Uh, but broader, it's also about, you know, um, how our very culture is, is militarized, how our children are being prepared for war through gaming from a very young age recruited by the military uh, in this sort of never-ending war on terror um, that we have just gotten way too comfortable and, and used to uh, and, and not really questioning what the long-term consequences of what we're doing Brandon, are. Brandon, do you feel, do you feel that as a, as a soldier you were militarized kind of at a young age? Were you sort of raised in a way that said uh, that would make this an easy decision for you to get involved, to enlist? Uh, not actually, that's kind of the strange thing, is um, I was raised uh, away from war and conflict. I'm the first person in my family to join the military since um, World War II. I don't even think my grandfather, um, well, he was in the Air Force, great-grandfather, and he worked on the atomic bomb. 
Hmm. But uh, uh, the rest of my family, we've never been militarized. Uh, small town people. I, I kind of joined the military simply because I couldn't afford to go to school. Um, and of course, I was trying to impress a girl. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and um, why does it always come back to that, Brendan? That's what I want to know. It, it, it's because it's uh, you know hormones, I guess. Um, <laughs> That's part of it. Part of it. It it has to do with the fact that we're not really raised to know what it is to be a man, and sometimes when we join the military, we think that that's how we're going to get our man card. But really, I've, I've learned a lot over the last um, decade, actually, of my life. Uh, dealing with this, uh, I joined to, you know, for economic reasons, I ended up in a position where I had to, um, I had to do it, and uh, I, I was always, I was raised by my great-grandfather and my mother, uh, my mother was a teacher who raised me to be a critical thinker and love literature and uh, a deep thinker, and my grandfather raised me to be a kind and loving man. Hmm. Uh, and so it, it kind of, I, I was raised right and forced into a military uh, position, and, uh, and I, I gave my word. And my grandfather told me once, he said, the only thing that a man has of any worth in this world is your word. And if you cannot fulfill your word, then you have no worth. And so I, I did it anyway, regardless of how I felt. And um, I, I think that's kind of part of the reason why I have so much power is because I did do my job, and I did do it the right sure. way. And, so when you went in, you clearly went in with a, uh, a, um, a conscience that said, I, I'm doing the right thing, I'm doing the noble thing, I've taken this oath, um, all sort of, you know, honorable uh, notions, right? Honorable ideas about how to live as human beings, never mind men, but right. men and women, right? Right. And, and then during the process of your training, et cetera, and then the actual uh, uh, piloting of the drones, you came to some... Was it an epiphany? Was it a moment? I mean, how, how do you come to that moral place where you go, okay, holy smokes, this is not right? Um, well, it, it actually didn't feel right from the beginning because they, they were trying to sensationalize it with us. Um, when I first got, got into the program, I didn't know. They, they told us that we, they couldn't tell us what we were doing until we got there. And then when we got there, they showed like a montage video of drone strikes played with heavy metal music. And I like heavy metal music, so... Uh, but then after the video was over with, we had a sergeant come down and stand in front of us and says, your job is to kill people and break things. And uh, they tried to make us seem like badasses and, and, and glorifying it. And um, I went to my commander and was like, sir, I, I, I don't think I can do this. And he was like, your property of the United States government, you swore an oath to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, you will do your job. And, uh, you know, goes back to giving my word, so I did it, and even up until the very point when I, I had my first strike, I was still questioning on whether or not I could do it, and, um, you know, I, I learned a pretty significant lesson that, that we make life cheap through this, a really cheap, um, almost worthless. Um, T Tonya, what did, what did you, I, I want to come back to a comment you made early on in the film, you know, the, the point and click, you know, you, I think your, your direct quote is, it was, quote, it was point and click, and, you know, so disinterested, it sounds so detached, I mean, I, I grew up playing asteroids and space invaders, sorry, I'm showing my age, but uh, I, I did, those were kind of point and click, but not in the same way they are today that my son's growing up with, and so on. So I want to come back to that, Brandon, but Tonya, what do you learn about truth? What do you learn about storytelling as a documentarian with regard to, uh, to, to Brandon's story, to what's going on here, this kind of, you know, very interconnected web of lies, or at least so it seems? Well, I think uh, Brandon's uh, voice in this uh, is incredibly important. Uh, and. Um, you know, for me, when I was going to make this film, um, I really wanted to uh, tell the story um, of our new warriors, the, the drone pilots, you know, kind of get to the inside of what it means to, to kill with a joystick and what it means to be part of this, this new warfare. And it was incredibly um, hard to get access uh, to the U.S. Air Force. Um, and I had spent about a year 
you know, calling the Pentagon and the, the Hollywood office of the U.S. Air Force. Can you just call up the Pentagon? Can you just pick yes. up the phone and call the Pentagon? <laughs> yeah, they, they don't answer. They definitely <laughs> didn't answer me. You don't so, get through, like, do you get voicemail? Like, what do you get? Yeah, you leave a voice message. And I, I started getting, getting uh, pretty creative in my, my message. I, I, I bet you did, yeah. But um, right when I was um, <clears throat> in the midst of that, um, you know, Brandon spoke out in, uh, in Der Spiegel, and it, it was something about Brenda's story um, that really moved me. And um, then I started to uh, hunt Brenda down for quite some time. <laughs> we, um, we used about nine months to, to get to know each other, um, you know, mostly through social media. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, it's been an incredible honor to work with Brandon. Um, to me, uh, he's one of the, the bravest people we have today. Um, and it's something, you know, for, for Brandon to speak out and, and to tell the truth, to, to break the lies and, and sort of deconstruct the notion that the drone war is the, you know, surgical, precise, perfect way to fight terrorism that is, uh, is so incredibly important for, for people to, uh, to hear and, and understand today. So, so... Every comment leads to another question, uh, but I want to get back to that as well, the surgical way of fighting terrorism. There's so much sort of, you know, the book 1984 by George Orwell, there's so much Orwellian newspeak that goes on. There's one one interview you have with, with one of the, uh, um, I think a senator, and I've got his name here and I can't think, uh, I can't find it right now, but this, you know, the whole idea of a smart bomb, right? I mean, what exactly is a smart bomb, right? But um, so, so Brandon, uh, some, somebody in the film talked about uh, the, 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 this uh, dehumanization of the killing, you know, the point and click like nature of it. You're on a screen. You, and, and what really struck me was, is here's the quote, uh, you never, quote, you never know who you are killing. You never see a human face. Is that, do you think that had something to do with your, uh, maybe you didn't have a shift because you say you always felt there was something not quite right about it. Do you think you, you have a problem with killing other people, or is it that you have a problem with killing other people that you can't see? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So um, you, you told us earlier before the, the show that you're into philosophy. Yes. So I'm not, War philosophy has been kind of a specialty, specialty that I've been studying for nice. the last decade. And um, no matter what, every, everyone should have a problem with killing, even soldiers. The, the thing is, is that... Um, Soldiers kill because it's necessary, not because of what anyone else says. It's because there is a, a, it's a last moment thing, and it should be done with sorrow and regret every single time. Mm, nice. And and um, so uh, what actually the dehumanizing aspect? It didn't dehumanize these people. I don't know if you've ever heard of a game called The Sims. And and it's kind of like that, where you 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 just see people live out their lives uh, day in and day out. You really have no control over over what they're doing, except for when you press the button to do action. And um, you're you're sitting there in a cold, dark box, watching these people do their thing, and they're living their lives. We aren't. We're spending hours, twelve hours a day doing nothing but watching these people. And so it made me me feel less human, not the other people. They, they were really human. I, I saw everything. I saw uh, men who had been planting bombs or, or shooting at other people come on play with their kids, kids playing soccer, women cooking food and hanging clothes and, and doing doing what their culture is has them do. Don't, don't, um, don't you refer to yourself as the ultimate voyeur in the film? Yeah. I do, um, and, and it's true. It's um, they're never going to know that we're there, and uh, it, it's it's strangely um, it's strangely perverted. As a documentarian, Tonya, is it important is it important to you to um, um, tell a story that points to the truth, or to actually make sure you're telling? The, the, the story in a truthful way does that does that make any sense I know I, I saw a quote from Ken Burns recently and he said yeah you know I don't even care if the story is true <laughs> which I found 
kind of, and I might be taking them out of context a little bit, but but I guess what I mean is, and I, and I think it, it echoes back to my earlier question of what is the movie really about? It's really not about drones, right? This is about freedom and, and, and about voyeurism. I mean, there's such a yeah. long... Yeah, exactly. It's about becoming better humans, isn't it? As corny as that might sound. Well, I think that, you know, what is, what is great about making a film is that everybody has their own perception of what is true and not true. And um, I think that, you know, everybody's going to have their own experience watching this film. Um, I had my own experience. And, and to me, being a, a documentarian, I think that, you know, my... Uh, how I see things to be true and how I make up my argument uh, is what makes, you know, this film um, sort of my, my point of view or my take on the situation and then everybody else uh, should, you know, see this and, and make it their own. Um, I don't think there's uh, one such thing as an objective uh, truth, um, at, as, you know, when you talk about that. Um, What's important to me is, uh, is to, to tell a story that has touched my heart, and then hopefully, uh, you know, in doing so, I will uh, touch other people's hearts. I, and it I, has been just incredibly uh, moving to see the, the responses that this film has gotten uh, from school children and, and up to politicians uh, here in Europe. Uh, so it's especially, you know, interesting and exciting to see uh, how this film is going to be perceived in, in uh, North America right now. So yeah, you're, you're currently in Norway doing kind of a high school tour, is that right? Yes. And, and the response has been inclusive and an embrace and, and very receptive. It's been, it's been pretty incredible. It's been it's amazing. this amazing journey. Um, into all these small villages uh, in, in the most beautiful area in Norway, uh, tons of uh, high mountains and fjords, and, and the nature here is just, you know, mind blowing. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> so, so you're not you're... coming to this like small little local theaters, you know, where um, the teenagers have gathered and they're just lit up and they're ready and they they take it in and especially for them to meet Brandon. Uh, and to see uh, Brandon sort of light the light their eyes up, um, and you know we've had to just you know give a lot of hugs and um, Brandon has taken a lot of selfies. Or not he, <laughs> but everybody lines up to take their selfies with Brandon. So <laughs> Brandon is is an incredible storyteller, and and how he reaches out to the kids uh, has also been you know um, a great honor to to be a part of and, and uh, experience. So you can't you can't undervalue the uh, that the the huge like the, the the splash and ripple effect, right? So they see your film on their own. That's great. They in a, in a dark theater, they come away wondering. They can ask questions. They get it introduced by Brandon with Q and A afterwards and a selfie. That's the kind of life changing moment I believe can make all the difference, right, Brandon? It's the eye contact. It's a handshake. It's kind of the direct opposite of what you spent a few years doing in that box in the desert, right? I mean, oh, yeah. talk about a beautiful contradiction and paradox and irony of what's actually playing out here post film. And so all these unexpected outcomes of all these people that you're meeting all over the world, I'm getting, I'm getting a shiver. I'm getting, I'm getting a shiver. It's cool. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah. It's like one, one response that just seems to, you know, um, that we hear over and over again is that it's just, you know, thank you so much. Uh, we had no idea. Why did we not know about this? You know, we re read the news. We, uh, we, you know, keep on track of what's going on, but we had no idea, and with tears in their eyes, and and that's been um, a very, very powerful experience. But I think there's a there's an assumption that uh, in the West, anyway, in Canada, in the U.S., and governments that supposedly uh, work with uh, uh, the rule of law, and you know, uh, an ethic of some kind, some sort of virtue ethic or a utilitarian ethic of some kind that says we behave in a certain way. And so I, as a citizen, when I see your film, I go, come on, that can't be really happening, is it? Right? And so you, you, you do, you have these moments where you go, this is an outrage, right? So it's, it's the kind of thing as a filmmaker that must, um, you must see this kind of stuff a lot, Tonya, and say, there's, there's something else I got to make a film about, right? I bet your list of, of films that you want to make is pretty long. That would be my sense. <laughs> 
Well, I think that, you know, one of the reasons why I went into documentaries to, to tell the stories that are being silenced or, or are not being told in, in mass media. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things to choose from, uh, for sure. So, so, Brandon, here you are talking to the video game generation. Correct. On a stage. Uh, lots, I guess mostly guys are playing these video games for the most part. I would I imagine there's some You'd women. You'd be surprised. Um, there's probably actually more girls that play video games than guys, but most of the guys play stuff like Call of Duty and Battlefield and um, the shooter type genres. The, um, the, the, I don't know who it was. I think his name, Andy Von Floto, which is a, from your film, the, the drone maker. Says, mm -hmm. what was his line? Um, young men like to smash things. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, in other words, we all, but I think everybody likes to smash things at some point. We've all, we all deal with anger of one kind or another. That doesn't mean you get into a box somewhere in the Nevada desert and shoot people, right? Right. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a disconnect there, it seems to me. Right. Um, and I think that uh, uh, money has to do a huge part of it, greed. Um, and, and when talking with these kids, um, I tell them, of course, I always tell them to, to don't get into debt and take responsibility for their own actions and to be more self-aware. I think that's incredibly important. But I think one thing that they might take for granted that I, I remind them of is I, I was alive and growing up when the internet first started and um, they're more interconnected now than I ever was. And everyone's the same behind a keyboard. Doesn't matter if your religion, race, sexuality, gender, creed. Um, everyone's the same. Everyone can express an opinion. And I always make sure that they understand the fact is that they're going to vote for people to represent them in government at some point. And they're the ones that are supposed to take orders from them, not the other way around. Don't let them put fear into you. Don't let, don't let the media, don't let the politicians, don't let their religion, don't let anyone else tell them that something wrong is something right. And I think that's a, a, a that they, they take a hold on to that. I think this idea, you know, uh, what you just said is uh, really, is, is, as, a as a fellow philosopher, right? I mean, you, you sound like a bit of an existentialist, right? Responsibility, freedom, choice. Take responsibility for your own actions. Choose, move forward, and you know, as Kierkegaard says, you're only going to understand it when you look back, right? And then, then you see the dots. Then you see things, how they, how they connect, uh, how they start to make sense. How do you take responsibility as a soldier for your own actions? Because isn't that kind of the beauty of being a soldier that you don't have to? How do, how do you, st I mean, you clearly stood up. You, you, you fought back. How do you do that in that environment? Um, well, it's really difficult because everyone wants to dis uh, diffuse responsibility. Like, I, I, mean, I mean, look at history. Look at the Nuremberg trials. People were tried simply for following orders. We, can, we cannot, we, that's been a historical landmark. And we can't go back on that. We can't just say, oops, I was following orders. And they kind of try to diffuse responsibility by saying, well, orders come from the highest echelon. Orders come from this part. Well, we still carry out the actions. We are still responsibly, responsible for our actions, regardless of who gives us the orders. And um, I think a lot of people confuse warrior with soldier. Mm. So they're completely two different things. A soldier can be a warrior. But a warrior is not necessarily a soldier. You know, warriors in ancient past, warrior philosophy was understanding the spiritual, physical, and psychological nature of war to prevent war. Sun Tzu's The Art of War says the best battle that is fought is one that isn't fought. And uh, even Sun Tzu's The Art of War is supposed to be required reading for all military members. I would, I, I would actually hope that the Iliad and the Odyssey would be required as well. And... Um, it's things like this, uh, the de devaluing of, of intellect, the devaluing of, of choice, the, the, the glorification of it. Um, you know, because soldiers, they, they don't want to know that what they've done is wrong. They want to know what they've done is for glory, for honor, for protection of others. And, and once you start questioning that, it really, it, it, that is them. That is us. We do that. We live for fighting. We live for the battle. And when, when, we, when it is not healthy, when it is not right, and it, we question it, that's when you get the numbers that are happening right now in 
America of 22 veterans a day killing themselves. And it, it's horrible. And I've talked to soldiers from other countries, and they're not getting the help that they need as well. Because, and, and they're questioning what's going on. And we have our, our political system is, is really screwed up. We have like less than 2%, I think, of our congressional body that has actually had military experience, and they're the ones sending us to war. Right. That shouldn't happen. That should not happen. We should have more military veterans in congressional political positions. We should have journalists in po political positions. We should have the people that actually care about these matters beyond the fact that, that they're getting a paycheck. Our, Cana our Canadian government just put a uh, man minister of defense in, into place who's actually served in Afghanistan, uh, and I'm not sure that, I mean, fairly recently as well. So it's, uh, you know, and I got to say, I'm just going to put a little Canadian plug in here. I think we have, uh, as a result of our recent election, I think we have 184 new members of parliament who had not been in parliament before. Now that's no question a liability on some levels, but I think it's also an indicator that change can occur, right? Well, you know, that I people can say, I've had enough of this, and I want something else. I want something different. There, there is a reason. We, we had our highest uh, voter turnout in history, in, all right, well, in recent history. And so things can change. Well, that's kind of incredible because the, uh, I think less than 30% of the American population voted in our last election. And I'm, I'm going to kind of disagree with you on, on the lack of uh, parliamentary experience. I think that we need, we need people like teachers and scientists and veterans and journalists in these positions, especially after they've had their experience. We shouldn't have people go to be politicians. Right, to right. Learn to yeah. be politicians. No, I'm, I'm with you there. I guess my point was is that here we got 184 new, over half of them are new, right? They, they, they've never been here, but they're not professional politicians. Right. That's good. I yeah. Like exactly. That. Yeah. No, I'm with you. I, I think you're absolutely right because what you're saying is you're you're gaining experience from other other perspectives, other worldviews, right? Correct. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think yeah. humanity is strong in its diversity. I think like that's kind of the funny thing about like all these governments who want to you know we have this the you know Trans Pacific Partnership and all these things that are trying to co cohe co puts everything under one cohesive banner, but that that gets rid of the strength of humanity. Like, everyone has different experiences. Everyone's lived in different places, experienced different things, and, and that's where we get our strength. And as soon as we understand that, I think that's where we'll get them forward, especially since we're so connected now. Tonya, Tonya you know, uh, D.W. Griffith said that the purpose of filmmaking was to make you see. That's what he wanted to do as a filmmaker back in the early 1900s. Is that, is that why you, you, you wanted to make documentaries? I've heard some documentarians say, you know what, I make movies for myself. I see an issue, I have a passion about it, I want to make it for myself. I'm not getting that sense from you. Uh, certainly not in this conversation anyway. You know, you... Yeah, you, no, I think, I think uh, you know, uh, for me, I always think about trying to reach the most amount of people that I can. I mean, I, I make uh, films because I feel like I have something important to, to share uh, and stories that need to be told that, you know, everybody should uh, should know about or see or hear and feel. Uh, and especially, especially the young audience is very uh, interesting to me. So I think, you know, in my films, I always strive to, to make films that appeal to to the young audience um, as well as you know older people as well but um, it's something about reaching out to youth that is uh, mm -hmm. especially important to me she's an educator at heart would you guys describe yourselves as uh, I would agree with that would you guys describe yourselves as hopeful cynics um I would say I, I would say that I'm an optimistic optimistic realist okay. actually instead. Okay. Um, like, I, I believe in the greater good, and um, I believe in our higher purpose. And my, I, I've been through some pretty bad things. I've lost friends and family over this issue. I've, I've lost brothers and sisters, better fellow veterans who have wow. threatened to kill me because of whatever reason. Um, but I still, I, I just believe it's because they're, they're hurt, and they don't want to question things. And my grandfather kindest and gentlest man that I'd ever met, and he, 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 he taught me a lot, I mean, the old wife, and, you know, in everyone's story, and um, the thing that I learned from him the most is that, that love is actually extremely powerful, 
And you're not going to do anything if you don't care about it. You're not going to protect something if you don't love it. And the very definition of love is to give it to someone who doesn't, you you feel doesn't deserve it. So, um, and and I, I, I love my country. I do. And my country isn't represented by my government. It's my people. And, and my brothers and sisters are being sent to war for, for the wrong purposes. They're being misused and abused. And I love them. Regardless of however they feel about me, I love them. And I don't want to see my brothers and sisters be broken and come home damaged and kill themselves and be discarded by the system that says that they would take care of them. And um, I think that's really the, the message behind what, what I feel is that regardless of how bad things get, love is always going to win. Yeah, I mean, how how do you how do you top that? I think that's a that that might be a pretty good place to to wrap up the interview. I mean, I I'd I'd like to sit here and talk to you guys all day, honestly. I mean, maybe we can do a part two after the film airs. Is that a possibility? I, sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I I just so appreciate your 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 generosity, both of you, and I know the audience rabble and my audience are going to as well. And so so tell us real quick. Um, so premiering uh, North American premiere next week, New York City. You guys are going. Are you've been on tour, but you've got a you've got some some touring to do still, right? Yeah, we're we're going straight from uh, from Norway to uh, to New York City, okay. uh, and it's going to be a, a very very exciting week. Uh, we can't say much more than that, but we um, highly recommend that people stay tuned and uh, follow us on Facebook. Um, all kinds of things are going to happen. Um, drone documentary, um, and um, our premiere is on Friday. Okay. Uh, the 20th, that's uh, 7 o'clock at the AMC Theater on uh, Times Square. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. And the, web, and, and, the, and the website is dronethedocumentary.com. Dronedocumentary.com, yeah. And uh, it's my 30th birthday when we premiere this film. Oh, so, come on. Uh, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nice. a good, good coincidence. What, uh, what did you get him for his birthday, Tonya? The it has film. not. It has not. Yet. It is a surprise. It's a surprise. But, you know, uh, it's uh, it's looking like a, a good celebration. I I, I I I bet it will be. Hey, uh, thanks so much for joining us today, Brandon Bryant, uh, Tonya Hesenche. Yes. Hesenche. Yes. Sorry, I'm so sorry, Tonya. Totally okay. No thank worries. you so thank you so much, guys, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for having us. Me.